Okay, today we're talking about urinating in public. This is something that we see almost only out of the city of Scottsdale, and this is because the city of Scottsdale has their own city code, and they enforce urinating in public very, very frequently. So let's back up a little bit and talk about the different laws. So most criminal laws are based on the Arizona code. You have the Arizona revised statutes for DUIs or for domestic violence. And if you're charged with a crime, they will almost always originate and be based upon those statutes. Well, individual cities can establish their own codes as well. And so the city of Scottsdale has theirs and they have very specifically carved out a urinating in public law and they don't ignore it. They enforce it very, very often, very frequently. And in fact, we don't see this type of charge anywhere else throughout the state of Arizona, only in Scottsdale and only in one kind of very specific area. And we'll take a look at that here on the map. And so this is just a brief map of Old Town or just a kind of a, a very narrow snapshot of it. And you can see here, this is Scottsdale Road. This is the downtown Scottsdale area where there's a lot of bars. You have, uh, you have Maya, you have Whiskey Row, you've got Bottle of Blonde, you've got the W Hotel, um, Wasted Grain. You've got all these different places where people love to go and, and have a good time. They're out, they're having some drinks, they're out with friends. And the police will wait for them to leave the bar either at closing time or um, when they're going in between bars or they're going to wait for their Uber or their Lyft and they'll wait in alleys, they'll wait in a little, some of these side roads, there's a lot of side roads kind of around here or alleyways. And so the police will actually hang out there and they'll wait for people to go and urinate. And so it's something that happens very frequently and the police are on bicycles and they're just doing laps and they're just waiting for something to happen. So that's kind of the context on, of how we see this most often and we see it a lot you can see here this is our office so we're right down the street from old town we're in the city of scottsdale the scottsdale city courts right around here uh, so we're there all the time and we see these very very often so that's kind of an idea of where it's happening it's not happening at baseball games it's not happening you know after a uh, nice restaurant the dinner at a restaurant it's right around these areas where there's a high concentration of bars people are out drinking and the bars will shut down, the bouncers will force everybody out. You will not be back in, allowed back in to use the restroom. It doesn't matter how badly you have to go. They will force you out. And so sometimes people are kind of left without an alternative and it's kind of a, a physical emergency that they're having. So they have to go to the bathroom. Um, but that's really where it's happening and that's where we see it a lot. So the question then becomes, okay, if you've been charged with this or somebody you know has been charged with it, what does it mean? What is this going to do to you? What is the penalty? What does the process look like in defending one of these cases? And so that's what we're going to jump into throughout the remainder of this video. As I said, this is really focused on the Scottsdale City Court with the Scottsdale Prosecutor's Office for the Scottsdale City Code. So if you're watching this for some other court, a lot of this may not be relevant for you. But as I said, we don't see it anywhere else. So let's take a quick look at the law. Um, really, the law, uh, I'm not gonna diagram it out or explain it. It says that you're urinating or defecating in public uh, without using a toilet. I mean, it's really pretty simple. It's about a one-line law, and uh, it really doesn't require a lot of legal interpretation. Either you were using the restroom or, or you weren't. You were urinating in, in an alley or on the road or behind a dumpster or whatever it is. So that's how it works. Now, the penalties, uh, the law classifies this, the Scottsdale City Code classifies this as a class one misdemeanor. So that's really the highest level of a crime that you can have in Arizona. You have, for any crimes, you have class one, class two, and class three misdemeanors. And so urinating in public is a class one. This is the highest class of a misdemeanor offense in Arizona. It's the same class as a DUI, domestic violence, some cases of assault and those types of things. So it is quite serious. Now it doesn't have any mandatory penalties, meaning you don't have to go to jail. You don't have to register as a sex offender. Really the only thing that the law says is you have to pay a fine. And if there's gonna be any cleanup costs, you're gonna be responsible for those as well. But this is where you fall in the grand scheme of things. Now, again, it's not a felony. Felonies would be up here. And it's not a civil violation, which would be below here, but it is a class one misdemeanor. And so a lot of people are concerned about that. Again, you don't have to register as a sex offender in our experience. Scott still doesn't require that. Theoretically, there's a lot of overlap between 
more serious offenses and urinating in public, but we've never seen that. So you don't have to worry about that too, uh, too um, um, much. But anyways, that, that's where it is. It, it, it is in the context of criminal offenses. Okay, so now, if you have been charged with that, obviously you're watching this video because you want to learn a little bit about what we can do or what you can do to avoid having that go on your record. You certainly don't want to have a urinating in public um, offense. And so people will call us very frequently and they'll say, hey, this is my first offense. I was just in town. I was traveling to Arizona. I wasn't even, you know, I was staying there for two nights. I was at, uh, at the W. I was in town for a conference, whatever they were doing. And so I've never been in trouble before. So can we go into Scottsdale and negotiate this down into something that is not a class one misdemeanor? They want to drop it down into a civil violation or they want to do you know, community service or do some sort of a diversion where they take a class or, or just pay a higher fine in exchange for not having a criminal conviction. Unfortunately, Scottsdale almost never negotiates on these cases, almost never. It's a policy that is put in place by the uh, main the city prosecutor, her name is Karen Close. And so if she's at the top, she has all these different prosecutors. So we'll say this is Karen Close. She, she has a policy that she establishes at the top and it goes down to all of the other prosecutors throughout the city of Scottsdale. And it's basically prohibiting them for reducing a class one misdemeanor of urinating in public down into something else. Almost never happens. The times that we've seen it happen or that we've been able to do it is when there's a, you know, a very extremely weak case or there's some sort of an emergency. There's a medical emergency. This was something that was involuntary. You know, something else happened that required um, the, that person to actually do, some, you know, to do this. And so the prosecutor's office will deviate from the policy. But just because this is a first offense, just because you've never been in trouble before doesn't mean that it's gonna be as simple as you walking in and getting your case reduced down. It's a policy across the board. If I'm mistaken and another attorney has seen something different, I would love to know about it because as I said earlier, our office is right down the street. We only do criminal defense and so we see a lot of these types of cases and Scottsdale in our experience just has a blanket policy across the board where they will not reduce these down. So you have to keep that in mind. So what does that mean for you? Well, there is an option of just pleading guilty to the charge. You always have that option. Uh, you don't have to fight it. You can go in and plead guilty. And as I explained earlier, it's very likely that they're just going to ask you to pay a fine, not put you on probation, not require any jail time. In fact, most of the time you're already, you've already spent uh, the night in jail. They'll arrest, the police will arrest you take you into custody, release you the next morning. So they're not gonna ask for any additional jail time. And so some people wanna do that. They don't wanna litigate these cases anymore. They just wanna make this go away as quickly as possible. If it's not gonna impact your job or if you're okay with having a criminal conviction, you can save your money on a lawyer and just go do that on your own. You don't need to hire somebody to do that for you. It's not very complicated. Most people don't wanna do that, of course. And if you're still watching the video, you know, I'm sure you're one of those, those individuals. So. Let's talk about how we actually defend against these cases. So out of the city of Scottsdale, they run their case pattern in a unique way. They don't do it like a lot of other courts do. They call things, certain things, uh, different court proceedings have, have uh, very specific names and different things happen as the case progresses. And so the structure of a case actually looks like this. So the, the very first court date that you would have in your case um, almost always is what's called an arraignment and this is the court date where you'd go into court, the judge would tell you what you've been charged with, and I've already basically explained that. Class one misdemeanor, the maximum penalties, as I said. Um, well, I, maybe I didn't say them, but a class one, the maximum penalty is not what we ever see people get, is six months jail, $2,500 in fines plus surcharges, up to five years probation. So the judge would tell you what that is at that time. You would enter a plea of not guilty when people uh, engage our firm to represent them on that we enter a plea of not guilty for them. Then what Scottsdale will do is they'll reschedule a case for what's called a pre-trial conference. That's really the most substantive court date um, after the arraignment. The arraignment is just kind of a big, kind of a cattle call. Everybody goes into court. They call everybody up one by one and say, you've been charged with DUI, you've been charged with domestic violence, you've been charged with urinating in public and then they uh, move you on to the next court date. What happens in between this court date and this court date in a urinating in public case, 
our office, we want to request everything, everything that they've got in their file. Police reports, any officer's notes, any body cam footage. Some of them have uh, the, the body cam cameras that they've got. We want to see what the officer has in their file or what they, what they were able to observe. We also want to see if there's any witness statements, any 911 calls. Did anybody see that happening? Did anybody call it in? Uh, were there anybody else, you know, uh, like bouncers or anybody else who, who made this report? If they did, we want to know what they had to say. Is there any surveillance footage? What, did one of these clubs have footage that was uh, impounded? Did the police gather any evidence? What is in their file? In other words, what do they have that they're going to use to prove the case? We make that request immediately, and then the Scottsdale will start to gather that stuff and start to disclose it to us. They, they you know, make us pay fees and things, depending on what's out there. But we do make that request, and then it will start to trickle in at the pretrial or sometimes after the pretrial. And so almost always, this is just a quick continuance. Then the case gets rescheduled for what's called a case management conference. You can see there it's called a CMC. At the case management conference, the judge wants to know. They want an update. They give us a written uh, form that we have to fill out. Judge will say, uh, have the interviews been completed with the officers? Are there any witness statements? Are there any other interviews that are being scheduled with those? Are there any pretrial issues? Are there going to be any motions to preclude testimony? If we're having any issues with the prosecutor's office, are, why? What are they and why? And then the judge can uh, try to settle some of those things at that time. Um, it's almost always a continuance from there as well. Then you have what's called a TRC. So this is a trial readiness conference. And then the final part of a case could be a trial. All right, and people hear the word trial and it scares them a little bit. They don't want to go to a trial. They don't want to actually sit in court and go through the big process of having the officers come in, testify, having opening, closing arguments, and, and basically doing what you see on the movies. They don't want to do that. And we can understand why. All right, it's a, it's a nerve-wracking experience. It's something where things can be very tense and there's a little bit of, a, of an unknown there. And so a lot of people don't want to do that. They'd be more interested in resolving the case okay and this is how you do it uh, you can resolve the case by taking a plea deal by, by actually going into a plea agreement and as I explained earlier because of this policy there is almost always no plea deals no reductions okay now they might argue while well, we're not asking for jail or anything so that's a deal for you I disagree I don't think that the judges out of Scottsdale and we know them well there's about four of them that we deal with on a regular basis I don't think that they would be giving jail for this we We've not seen it often. Now, it's, you know, there's always exceptions to that rule, but uh, by and large, the deal, the deal that the prosecutor offers us, we believe is just not a deal at all. So we almost encourage our clients almost never to take that, okay? Again, that would be something that you can do right up here. You don't have to go through all of this entire process. And there's about 30 days in between each one of these settings. So it does take about three to four months. So you could resolve it by pleading guilty to the charge here. Save your money on an attorney, save your time, some of the stress of having to go through this process and go plead guilty. When people retain us to help them with that, they're not interested in this, and rightfully so. And so we are preparing the case, and any time that we even talk to somebody about this process, we are explaining you very well may have to go to trial on your case if you want a shot at not having a criminal conviction for urinating in public. It's just the reality out of Scottsdale. Okay, unless your case is, is somewhat unique, unless there are some serious kind of mitigating circumstances or some um, other reasons why this happened, the Scottsdale policy is tough and they're not going to reduce it down. They're not going to give you a deal that you're happy with. So we make this very clear at the outset. Okay, we don't try to tell people that, that we're going to get this done for them. We're going to resolve it with a, with a reduction because we've handled so many of them. We know that's not the case. So you have to be prepared to go to a trial. So people will then say, okay, well, look, I, you know, I very clearly was urinating. I had to go. They caught me in the act. They caught me red-handed. There's a lot of different ways that doesn't necessarily equate to enough evidence to find you guilty for it. And we'll, we'll dive into that here quickly. But let's say, for example, there's, a, there's an alleyway here, and there's a dumpster here. There's a club here and somebody leaves the club, they go back here and they, and they urinate, or allegedly urinate. This is what they have to prove. Scottsdale has to prove this. When you're charged with a crime, 
doesn't mean that you're guilty of it. You're still 100% innocent until you're either found guilty at trial or until you plead guilty in a plea deal. So let's back up. So in here, it, well, what, while we're in this uh, example here, if you are urinating back here and an officer comes right up upon you and sees you in the act, sees urine leaving your body, that's gonna be a difficult case to win, okay? An, ob an officer has direct view of what happened. This is called the, did you see his penis defense, all right? Did you see that, okay? If the officer did see that, it's difficult to refute that. And the officer, can, he can take the stand unless something happens that's abnormal and he sees that on a, on a very clear basis, it's hard, to, it's hard to contest that, okay? Because he's gonna be able to identify you, he's gonna be able to identify that the cause of the urine on the ground was you, was your body, there's no external you know, concerns there. He's just gonna be able to say he saw that, leave your body, and there it is. That's not what we see very often, okay? That does happen, we've seen those cases, and most of those people, you know, we, we'd say that their best option is not to contest that type of a case, uh, unless if there's some, you know, uh, kind of extraordinary circumstances. But by and large, most of our cases are not like that. They're not that cut and dry, okay? Most of the time, this will happen. So let's back up. So this officer is not anywhere near it. This individual will go, they'll, they'll uh, allegedly urinate. They'll be leaving, and then the officer will come upon them after the fact. So the officer will observe somebody here in proximity to this, and then they'll observe something on the ground. And that's about it, okay? So they'll, that's, that's all they'll, they'll see. Now, there are two issues with that. One is called causation, and causation means, okay, the officer can very clearly see there's an individual here, this person. There's also some urine on the ground, but can, they, can the officer's observations tie this to this? Was this person's activity the cause of that on the ground? And it's their job to prove that. And if you can raise doubt about that, and if you can show that there's some holes in that testimony or that the officer didn't actually see what he claims to, to have seen, and the officer in their police report will be very, very, very kind of matter of fact, I saw this, I saw this, I saw this, I saw that. But in their body cams or in other witness statements or things, once we start to piece together the, back, you know, the, the actual evidence that they've got in their file, that's all, not always 100% true, that it's actually not very accurate. And so they actually saw a lot less than they're claiming to have seen. And so they can't tie this individual to this. It's called causation, and it's a big issue for them. The other thing that this will implicate is what's called circumstantial evidence. So the, the analogy that we use in criminal law a lot is, is when it's snowing out. Okay, so say you come home from work, it's a clear day, there's no snow on the ground, you go to bed, you wake up the next morning, there's snow everywhere. Okay, that's, that you can presume that based on the fact that there's snow on the ground that it snowed. Where would the snow come from? Well, it came from the sky, therefore it snowed. And you can say, well, based on my inference, I'm inferring that it snowed because I now see snow on the ground. It snowed last night, there wasn't snow when I got home, there's snow there now, it must have snowed. Because that's how it normally happens. You're, infer you're making an inference. You're not considering the fact that some guy with too much time on his hand could have come with a snow plow or a snow a dump truck and dumped snow all over your neighborhood. That's a possibility. It's unlikely, but it is a possibility. That's called circumstantial evidence. It's, when, it's evidence that you have, to inf you have to make an inference about in order to come to a conclusion. And so in a case like this, the officer is inferring that because this individual was nearby this puddle, that that individual must have caused the... Uh, cause that puddle to happen. He urinated in public and they'll, you know, they'll charge him and arrest him or her and the case will proceed from there. There's a big difference between circumstantial evidence and direct evidence and that direct evidence is what I was explaining earlier. When the officer comes upon you or somebody that you're, you, you know, you're with and they see the actual urine leaving the body, that's direct evidence and so the officer can come into court and say, I saw it very clearly, this is what happened, therefore you know, I wrote him a ticket, I arrested him, and I charged him with urinating in public. So that's how it works, okay? Th those are where the, the, the defenses come into play. There's another way that people will handle these cases as well. Let's say that you were in the, the kind of the bad category of cases where the officer did have that direct evidence. He saw it very clearly. 
There's not going to be any arguments about circumstantial evidence or causation or anything else. You can plead guilty and then you can do what's called a motion to set aside a conviction. We call them MTSAs. Okay. Some people will want to know, how do I clear my record? Does Arizona have an expungement? Is there any way, if I do plead guilty here, can I come back and actually set aside this conviction? Uh, so as, as I said, Arizona does not have expungement. So you can't wipe this clean, meaning it doesn't just disappear from your record. But you can do a set aside. And what that means, legally speaking, and it's a little bit nuanced, and, and for some people this matters a lot, for some people it doesn't, but under the law, it says that you are relieved of all the penalties and all the liabilities that are associated with that guilty plea. That's the language in the law. And so for some people, that's beneficial because if they're applying for a job or this pops up on a background check or whatever their specific case is, they can then turn around and show an order from a judge that says, yes, I was convicted of this, but a judge said I paid all my fines, I fulfilled all my obligations of it, he has looked at the facts of the case, and he has set aside the conviction. Okay. What that means for you, it's going to be individual, of course. Uh, we can help you through that process as well. It's obviously a lot more or less cost intensive, meaning you don't have to go through all of this, do interviews, get body cam footage, and, and really begin preparing a solid defense. You can just basically go in and plead guilty. We walk you through a mitigation process where we talk about what your concerns are, how this could impact you. Then we file that motion to set aside the conviction. Your case gets you know, handled that way. It's not ideal but it is sometimes a better option for some people. And again, it depends on the circumstances of the case. So that's how urinating in public works, all right? It's not one of the more uh, interesting types of, of, of cases. It's pretty cut and dry. It's something that is very important. It's very common. It's very important for a lot of people because they wanna make sure that this is not going on their record. So you have to understand that it doesn't, you know, the, the, the video here kind of painted a grim picture of it because it really is. Scottsdale doesn't negotiate a lot on these things, but there is hope, all right? There is a way to get out of these cases, but it is going to depend on the very specific facts of your case uh, and not, it's not gonna be general. It doesn't apply across the board. So uh, if you do wanna talk about your case, if you wanna sit down with us, come into our office, speak with me, speak with somebody for my team, we'll put together a very solid plan for you. We'll talk about some of your options and we'll make sure that you can get through this in the, uh, with the least amount of damage, the least amount of harm possible. Thanks for watching.